Hey you guys, Flickers of Fear Time, my movie review series, and we're continuing on with Giallo July. Now, of course you knew that I wasn't going to be able to get through this entire month without talking about one of the directors, uh, if not the director that's most associated with the Giallo genre, and that would be Dario Argento. Now, I've actually covered a lot of Dario's kind of better known movies, I guess, like Deep Red and Tenebrae and Suspiria, obviously, Inferno. So I decided to go with one of his Giallo movies that is probably not that much seen or not uh, as remembered as well as some of his uh, other stuff. And so I'm going to be talking today about the 1971 film, The Cat of Nine Tales. Now, I had actually seen this, ooh, probably like 20 years ago or something like that and didn't really remember that much about it. So I had really been wanting to revisit it, you know, to kind of see, I don't know, just see like how the land lays or anything like that. Now, this movie is only Dario Argento's second movie and you can still, like, to an extent, you can still tell it's a Dario Argento movie. Like uh, like I said, if you're familiar with his later stuff, like, you can see, like, some of the hallmarks uh, of his later work. But I will say that this movie is actually, considering what his later stuff is like, was actually, like, pretty restrained. It's a pretty standard murder mystery, um, you know, and it has, like, some kind of weird touches to it, but not as bizarre, like, operatic as, like, some of his uh, other stuff. Now, Dario has admitted... Uh, uh, on multiple occasions. This is actually his least favorite film of all the films he've ma he's made. Now, he said this many years ago. I'm not sure if that still applies nowadays because, um, you know, if you follow his work at all, uh, I, I'm going to kind of say, like, since the 1990s, um, his work has been a little hit or miss, like, to put it kindly. I think, like, the last movie of his that I really liked was Stendhal Syndrome, and that was 1996, and there were some in there that I didn't see. So, the screenplay of Cat and Nine Tales, uh, was actually written mostly by Dario Argento in collaboration with, uh, Dardano Sacchetti, who actually worked primarily later on with uh, Lamberto Bava and also with Lucio Fulci. He actually wrote uh, one of my favorite F Fulci films, which is The Psychic. And there was also some, I believe, uncredited work in there by uh, Brian Edgar Wallace, who is the son of the very, very famous English crime writer Edgar Wallace, who a lot of Giallo movies like were based on his stuff. Um, but yeah, so Brian Edgar Wallace is a crime writer in his own right, and he like helped come up with this story as well. But but, like, when the production started, there was a lot of uh, dispute over the writing because Dario insisted that he be given sole screenwriting credit because the bulk of the production was based around, I guess, like, the first 40 pages of the script because I think, like, he wrote half and, like, Dardano Sachetti wrote half. So Dario wrote, like, the first half. That's what the production was. So he's like, well, I should get the only screenwriting credit and Dardano would only get, like, the story credit, which, you know, is you don't get as much money for that. Um, so there was kind of like a big rift. They had like a big, pretty big like public feud about it at the time. And I'm actually not sure if or when this was ever mended. I will go on to say that like Sachetti later on, like in the 1980s, he worked on uh, Demons and Demons 2, which were produced by Dario Argento. So I don't know if they had any uh, collaboration or if they, you know, were talking to each other at that point. Maybe they did bury the, hat bury the hatchet at some point. I'm not entirely sure. So The Cat of Nine Tales, it's kind of considered the second or the middle film, I guess, in Argento's uh, actually unconnected animal trilogy. They call it that. Uh, the first of which, which was his first movie, was The Bird with the Crystal Plumage from 1970. And then the third was also came out in 1971, and that was called Four Flies on Grey Velvet. Now, The Cat of Nine Tales, despite its title does not feature uh, an actual cat sadly because that would have that would that would have really like added something to it there's not an actual cat in it and there's not even like a cat of nine tails like a whip you know what i mean there's not one of those uh, either for that matter uh the phrase actually refers and this is a little bit I don't know. I feel like it was just kind of like convoluted. It was just kind of like squeezed in there. But it actually refers to like the nine leads or the investigative threads that the amateur detectives in the movie are pursuing. So it's almost kind of like like one of them makes a comment. It's like, oh, nine leads. It's like a cat with nine tails or something like that, which like I said, doesn't make a lot of sense, but whatever. But that's like what the name of the movie means. They very specifically say it. So the plot of this movie 
revolves around a blind man named Franco Arno, I think is his last name. Now he's played by Carl Malden. Uh, there's actually like a lot of, well, not a lot, but there's like a couple of American actors in here. It's, it's you know, like a lot of Giallo movies, they kind of have like a international cast and then they just dub it all into one language. This is actually not dubbed into English. This is actually dubbed into Italian, at least the version that I watched. So it's very, very funny to see like Carl Malden and like other American actors that you know are American actors and like seeing them dubbed into Italian. I don't know. I thought it was amusing anyway. Carl Malden plays this blind guy named Franco. Now, he's walking down the street one evening with his little niece, Lori. Like, he's her guardian, I guess, because, like, her parents died or whatever. Now, he has super sensitive hearing, like, you know, like a lot of blind people do. And he picks up what sounds like this, court, like, shady-sounding conversation having something to do with blackmail. And it's, like, this guy, he's in a, in a car or something like that, and he's talking. And he asks, like, the little girl, hey, like, why don't you check out that dude or, like, what kind of car it is or blah, blah, blah. Because he thinks that, like, something shifty is going on. Now, the following day, he actually finds out that the building that he was walking past when he heard this particular conversation has been broken into. Now, they don't think that anything was stolen, at least at first, um, And but one guard was, I can't remember if he was actually like hurt or killed, but like the guard at the front gate, like somebody, you know, knocked him unconscious or killed him or something. So, but yeah, they're like, yeah, so there's a break in, but we don't think anything is missing. Like it looked like nobody took anything. Now this building actually turns out to be the headquarters of a genetic research facility that's called the Terzi Institute. Terzi Institute. And one doctor who works there, whose name is Dr. Calabrese, he kind of like on the down low, he tells his fiance Bianca, oh, there actually was something taken from here last night and I know exactly what it is and I know exactly who took it. See, that's what, you don't like say shit like that out loud because uh, not too long after that, Calabrese is going to the train station to meet the person who took the whatever it was like presumably he's going to blackmail him like hey i know what you did um i know what you took so he goes to meet this guy and then somehow accidentally ends up falling in front of the train and getting squished now again like the cops just think oh you know he tripped and fell in front of the train too bad so sad uh so they are not treating it as a homicide now at this point uh, you have a journalist by the name of Carlo Giordani, and he's played by another American actor, James Franciscus. So he gets involved at this point. And Franco, the blind guy, uh, he actually believes that Calabrese was murdered because he thinks that there was some kind of connection between the conversation that he overheard, the break-in, and this guy dying like the very next day. So he's like, yeah, there's got to be something going on there. So Franco contacts the journalist, Giordani, Giordani, with his like suspicions. Now, what ended up happening was that it so happened that when Calabrese fell in front of the train, there was a photographer there and he got a picture of the guy like pulling. Of course, they like put it in the paper, like this guy going, oh shit, like right in front of the train. It's like, it was pretty hilarious. I mean, it's not, it wouldn't be hilarious if you actually saw that or like if it actually happened to you, obviously. But in the movie, it was like kind of funny. So he got a picture of it. But Franco is actually convinced that the published photo that they put in the newspaper, he's like, I'm curious to know, was that photo cropped? So him and uh, Giordani, they go to the photographer and the photographer was like, yeah, we did crop it like to fit it into the space or whatever. And he's like, can we look at the actual negative? Go look at the actual negative and see what you can see. So he goes in there and sees the actual photo that he took that wasn't cropped and looks at it like under the, the little loop thing or whatever. And he sees there's like a blurry like hand. Someone is obviously like pushing the guy like in front of the train. So he's like, holy shit, the guy was murdered. Seconds after that, <laughs> No, I'm talking about so maybe maybe a minute after that, the photographer is also killed. He's actually strangled or like garroted or whatever uh, in his dark room, and the original negative, as long uh, as well as the photos that he had printed from the negative, are stolen. So obviously, you know, somebody the killer doesn't want anybody to know what the fuck's going on. So from this point forward, uh, Giordani and Franco are on the case. They kind of like team up and they're gonna like work together. See what happened was Franco, 
he was blinded in an accident at some point in the past. They don't really get too much into that. But he says before that, he was also a journalist, like a reporter. Um, now he just, he makes crossword puzzles or something like that. But he said he really, really is into puzzles. And so he's very excited about, ooh, getting to the bottom of the mystery and everything like that. So the duo discover that the Tertsey Institute, one of their big projects that they've been working on has to do with XYY syndrome, uh, which is an actual thing. But in the 1970s, uh, there was a theory going around, which has since been discredited, that people that were born with this particular condition, like XYY chromosomes, um, were supposedly like genetically predisposed to criminal behavior there was like some kind of thing that went around it's like oh we tested like all of these prisoners and like all of them had that or something like that like i said that that's been discredited that's actually not the case it is a chromosomal like aberration but it doesn't like have a huge like some people don't even know that they have it like it doesn't really have any huge like they said sometimes the people have it they're a little bit taller or they have they tend to have like more learning difficulties or something like that but nothing like criminal behavior anything like it's very very low-key but in the 1970s they did believe that so that's kind of like what uh what the plot of this movie sort of like hinges around is this particular uh chromosomal uh abnormality so as i mentioned the cat and nine tails the cat with nine tails um that refers to like the leads that they're following like i said this sounded like when they laid it out i was just kind of like okay that didn't really sound like it made any sense but okay so the nine leads are actually like the five remaining doctors at the institute because like one of them got squished by a train obviously but the other five so those are like suspects there's two more suspects the guy who got squashed by the train like his fiance bianca because he told her you know i know who stole the shit so maybe she told the killer you know so that's a lead and then uh the guy that owns the institute tertsey he has a daughter named anna who it's kind of like turns out to be like a big plot point or like a red herring or something like that that she's his daughter but she's like his adopted daughter and also maybe he kind of has like a thing for her it's like it's a little weird <laughs> there's like all kind of like crazy like weird shit it's not crazy it's just like there's just like weird shit going on right here and then i think the other leads are considered to be like the photographs and the break-in and then there's like this note that Bianca supposedly had like in her locket or something like that. So basically Franco and Giordani, they start investigating each lead kind of one by one, but every single time they go down with like, it either ends up within like a dead end or an actual like dead person. Um, you know, as, as various like ones of their suspects like start turning up dead as well. And they also have their lives threatened on several occasions. Uh, you know, one of them, I can't remember like what the killer tried to do to the blind guy because they just, I don't think they show it. They just kind of like, he just says over the phone, but James Franciscus, um, you know, Giordani, he gets almost gets like poisoned by like somebody comes in and like injects poison into these milk thing, like milk bags that he has. And he's going to drink the milk because that's all he, all he has in the apartment. And like Anna comes over and they're like having like a romantic evening. He's like, want some milk? That's all I got. I'm like, ooh, you smooth talker. But yeah, um, <laughs> but they don't, but yeah, it has poison in it. So they do kind of have that. So yeah, you got poison milk. You got like a really, actually probably my favorite sequence in it where they have to like go to the cemetery at night and they're like creeping around in this vault because they're looking for this locket, um, you know, that supposedly has this note in it. So that's like really cool, like them creeping through the cemetery. One of the doctors at the Institute, this is, it's 1971, y'all. They think that he's a suspect pretty much only because, as far as I am aware, only because he's gay and he hangs out like at this like a gay bar called like i think it's called saint peter's or something like that so it's like just the fact that he does that they're like oh sketchy so like they have to like look into that so i thought that was like okay like i said 1971 so there's that yeah the, like i said there's a whole thing with tertsey and his daughter but she's not really his genetic daughter or like his biological daughter so maybe he has like he's in love with her it's like i don't know it's super weird um jordani and anna start a fling they have a thing going on uh there's a really weird scene with like this really hostile 
barber <laughs> that's like giving like you know doing the thing the shaven uh james franciscus with the straight razor and it's like being real fucking they think a barber did this like is the murderer and he's like i'll show them and it's like it, it was really funny and that guy like never shows up again so i just thought that was kind of funny and then there's also this other th this is what i'm saying about like this being a pretty standard like murder mystery but there's all these like just weird little details in there so you can kind of tell it's like dario argento there's also this character in there what's he called i think he's called Gigi the loser he gets kind of like pressed into service because I guess he's like a criminal, but he's also like a safe cracker, like he can open safes and stuff. But when he's introduced, he's not only in it for like a minute or something, but when he's introduced, it's in this bar and he's having like a swearing contest, like with this old guy and people are like taking bets on who can come up with the most... I guess like the the most insults with like for the other person without like repeating anything. Like you have to just keep coming up with them and stuff. I'm just kind of like, was that a thing in Italy? All right, that's that sounds fun. But yeah, so there's that. <laughs> I was just like like I said, just random kind of like details. Um, so yeah, so there's like a lot of strange little touches like that as sort of the mystery becomes, you know, starts to get resolved, it gets unraveled or whatever. But, you know, as I mentioned, this is pretty subdued, uh, you know, especially if you've seen some of Argent Argento's, like, later stuff. You know, the cinematography is pretty unobtrusive, pretty workmanlike. Um, there are a couple cool shots in there, but it's not like, you know, like I said, it's not like operatic or lurid or anything like later, like his later stuff. And another thing, too, is that the a lot of people get killed, but the kills aren't really all that gruesome. Like, mostly, like I said, people are just, like, strangled or garroted or they're just kind of, like, killed off screen. It's really not all that violent. Now, the guy getting hit by the train is pretty good, like, because there's, like, a very funny, like, close-up of, like, his the train, like, hitting his the side of his face and, like, blood coming out. And then, like, his body's, like, blah, 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 like underneath the train. And there's also, like, a really good scene with, like, a guy falling down an elevator shaft and, like, his hands, like, on the ropes going, like, shh, like that. That's, like, I like that a lot. But other than that, it's like pretty, like I said, it's pretty subdued, like as far as like the kills and stuff go. There's no, you know, oh, we're going to stab somebody's like, open, like beating heart that's like just like open in their chest or something like that. It's not like real splashy like that. So the mystery, like kind of at the heart of the movie is properly convoluted. There's a lot of red herrings and stuff, just like most Giallo movies. But I have to say that this one, I think the, like the resolution of the mystery like fell a little flat for me. And what I mean by that is that I kind of found it difficult to believe that the killer would go to all the trouble he went to for what seemed like kind of a petty or like not really like a pretty trivial reason. You know what I mean? It really didn't seem like, I don't know, it, it didn't seem important enough to like kill a whole bunch of people over <laughs> is what I'm saying. But I will say like on the plus side, I really did like, you know, Carl Malden and James Franciscus like teaming up like the, you know, detective team or whatever. I thought they were really good together. It's kind of like hard to, because, because they're dubbed into Italian, which like I said, was kind of amusing. So you don't really get their natural voices and stuff, but I mean, just their body language and stuff, they seemed like they seem like a good team, you know what I mean? I liked the the pairing of them together. And, you know, and the little girl, like, coming along, you know, uh, Carl Malden's, like, niece, Lori, like, her being along, too, and her getting in danger, like, later on. So that was good as well, because she was, like, really cute. So, I mean, the plot is a little bit slow moving and I don't think it hangs together quite as well as some of Argento's later films. Like I said, some of it seems a little forced or kind of like all over the place. But one, another thing that I did like was there's this kind of, I guess, like repeated sort of like thematic resonance having to do with nature versus nurture. That's kind of seems like the organizing, you know, theme of the whole thing with it. And it kind of like reflects in a lot of people's uh, relationships and a lot of the scenarios that happen throughout the movie. So I kind of feel like that's, like I said, like an organizational kind of motif. So I don't know. I feel like this is kind of one of Argento's probably lesser discussed works. You don't really, even people when they talk about Argento don't really talk about it all that much. Um, and I can probably see why. It's a good movie, but it's not, you know, like iconic. It doesn't stand out like some of his other ones do. But if you're a fan, it's still absolutely worth watching. I mean, if you like Giallo movies, this is actually like a really, really good one. I mean, I've seen way worse than the <laughs> worse ones than this, for sure. Um, this one actually does make sense and it does have like, you know, resolution of the mystery. And it's not, you know, it's not real visually appealing but it's still like a good character study and it's the mystery is kind of interesting i will say though that i actually like his first movie the bird with the crystal plumage 
better than this one. And I think contemporary audiences were kind of like in agreement on that one because I feel like Bird with the Crystal Plumage came out in 1970 and it was like a really big hit. I mean, that was his first movie. And then he made this one and everyone's like, meh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that one's, that one's okay, but it wasn't as good as the first one. And I don't think it's as good as the first one, but it's still like absolutely worth watching. It does have a lot to recommend it. I'm, But I'm only gonna suggest it if you've already seen like all his other like big, like iconic movies. Um, and you want to just kind of like delve deeper into his filmography or something like that. Like, especially it's interesting to see some of his early works, you know what I mean? Because he's, he just got so well known for doing stuff in like the late seventies, like with Suspiria and Tenebrae and well, Tenebrae was eighties, but you know, in deep red and stuff, but this is like a few years before that. So it was just kind of like interesting to see him when he was still like in his, in his baby director phase. So yeah, this is actually, um, I think. Was it Arrow or I can't remember who it was. It might have been Arrow. And they just put out a really, really nice, like, limited edition uh, Blu-ray of this. It's got, like, posters and all kind of, like, uh, extra shit on it, um, which actually looks really, really good. I mean, they always do, like, a really good job. If it's Arrow, I'm pretty sure it is. But it's if you want to watch it for free, it's on Tubi, and I think it's on several other streaming services as well. Uh, for free i think it might be on roku and stuff like that too so check it out um or if you've seen it let me know what you think about it in the comments and that will do it for this flickers of fear continuing on with giallo july so hopefully you'll tune in for the next one and that'll do it for this time around bye